Good evening, Mr. Bond fans, and welcome to another Bond movie debate, one that I'm very excited about this time because the general consensus might actually be on my side for once. For the first time in these videos, I'm not like defending the underdog. I feel like uh, this one has quite a, quite a following these days and, and we'll get into it. But um, with me as, uh, as always, of course, is David Zeritsky of the Bond Experience. How are you, David? I am doing great. And at first, when you said that, I'm thinking, what consensus is he talking about? What community is he talking? But yeah, <laughs> you're right. I mean, this is almost like if you're a connoisseur of James Bond, you tend to like this movie. You say it's unique and avant-garde and all the all the right things. So yeah, this is going to be where I'm kind of back on my heels. So I'm looking forward to this. Well, I'm, I'm excited going into this because we're recording this just like a week after your um, you ranked all of the Bond films. <laughs> And it was quite an experience watching that live and seeing the live chat explode when oh, yeah. you put License to Kill at second to bottom. And that was when I was like, huh, maybe I've got a chance with this next debate that's coming up. Yeah, I made sure not to go back and read those comments, but um, <laughs> I and I, I even asterisk it like we do all the time here. And we should also say this to everybody watching your channel right now that we love every Bond film. I love license to kill what i'm doing here and even in this discussion is i'm weighing them against all the others mm. and because i find for example with license to kill um the lows are lower than the highs and mm. that's why i kind of put it as uh yeah second to last yeah uh, i completely agree with you in that it's uh, even though we have these debates Barring maybe a couple of instances on either side, no Bond film is, you know, unwatchable or hated or yeah. we dislike all that much. So, um, yeah. But still, you did have a quote which I quite liked, uh, which I'm going to throw back at you now because you've okay. done this in past debates to me. Yes, I have. So, uh, a meal where the dessert is great, but everything else is meh. So I think that that I think you 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 tipped your hand a little bit there about how you feel about the ending at least. Um, I guess it improves for you as we go along. Um, but I did quite like that little quote. Some of it, yes, some <laughs> of it does. But uh, yeah, wow. I it, well, I look. I can't be responsible for what I say. <laughs> Don't do that to me. Well, I I do kind of want to get started with. Um, uh, talking about how, I guess if you'd have told me years ago that like I would at some point in my life be defending <laughs> License to Kill in a, in a debate with another Bond fan, I would have told you you were insane and you should seek urgent care immediately because I used to, this used to be like bottom of the barrel for me. Like particularly when I was a kid getting into Bond, I never connected with, with this one. I never liked it. And over the years, it really has sort of steadily gone up my ranking. So I'm curious to know from you, like when you first saw it and how your response to it was the first time yeah and i actually know that i saw this i saw this in the movie theater so mm -hmm. um and you know obviously being much older than you um it was that time and this is probably what weighs against it it was the time of you know rambo and predator and um you know all those 80s action films you know that that were coming out uh, lethal weapon for example i think even the same year so mm -hmm. I was on a rash of, if it was an action movie, I would watch it. And I wasn't as much into Bond back then, certainly as I am now, but I remember seeing it in theater because I was like, oh, it's an action film and it's a Bond film. So I kind of like all those, but I think I put action film first. And I remember walking away even back then, incredibly so with the group that I was with, thinking like, well, you know what? Um, when you stack it up against Lethal Weapon, it's not that good. Like yeah. I didn't stack it up against other Bond films because we just thought it was kind of, and I'll keep saying this, um, cheap looking. Mm. Like it was like a um, sort of action oriented made for TV movie try. And it, it a lot of people say Miami Vice, you know, they compare this to the Miami Vice things. And I think a part of it to me initially, it had all the tropes of that. It had kind of the, you know, Colombian drug warlord, which didn't feel like very Bond. It had the stock of the film that didn't feel like very Bond. To me, back then, Timothy Dalton has grown on me since. But back then, that wasn't my Bond. wasn't even close. I was Roger Moore, Sean Connery. It's like, who's this guy? So it didn't have the elements of Bond even back then. And that feeling continued. And now, as I went back and, and watched it for the first time, I was texting while I was watching it, if you remember, about some aspects I'm sure we'll talk about. <laughs> I was like... Yeah, I really just am not fond of this film. 
mm. still, but maybe even for different reasons. Hmm. Well, that's really interesting, actually, hearing your comments about seeing it at the time and coming out and having that kind of, it feels like it's made for TV, that whole Miami Vice kind of vibe, because I'm, I'm always kind of, you know, License to Kill is only a film that I've ever seen on like DVD. I've never seen a film print in the cinema or anything like that. Um, so I, I'm always sort of questioning, like, am I just reacting to the transfer that I'm seeing that hasn't been like properly mastered? So it's it's quite reassuring to hear actually that it was, that was your reaction to it earlier on, because I think you're right. It certainly does have that kind of TV Miami Vice kind of look to it. And particularly because they're, you know, they're down near the sea and Florida and all that kind of stuff it does have. And I think that that was a major stumbling block for me as well because it's it's every plot of every bad like Steven Seagal straight to DVD action film about oh my friend slash wife slash relative or whatever has been killed and I must go out for revenge against this drug lord and so it took me an awful long time to kind of get over that and kind of enjoy it and kind of I, I guess maybe I think it took the Daniel Craig films and reading all of the Flemings to really sort of hone my appreciation of this one and pinpoint in on the little things that I think like, oh no, actually that plot development does feel quite Fleming. And it is in the sense of, um, you know, like the early Roger Moore films, it's like you have your black exploitation one, you have your Kung Fu one, you have your water one, your space one. And this kind of is the Miami Vice bond. This is the bond that is reacting to all of those eighties action films. It, it is, and even the, um even the soundtrack. I mean, the, the mm. gentleman that they hired did the Lethal Weapon soundtrack. He did the soundtracks. It sounds like an 80s soundtrack and and it shows to me, which also, again, coming from John Barry and all this mm. richness. And, and I think what I have too is I went in order. In other words, when I saw that film in the theater, there was no Daniel Craig moment. There wasn't mm. even a Pierce Brosnan moment. So, so many people today say, well, Timothy Dalton paved the way for Daniel Craig. And I appreciate what they're saying, but I didn't have that reflection mm. in this film. I only had that first experience and then everything that I took over. So it's definitely heavily weighted against that. Can you remind me, we might have talked about this in our previous video, I can't remember. Have, did you watch The Living Daylights at the cinema when that came out? Did you see I that? Did. You, yeah, you, actually I've seen every Bond film, uh, I guess with the Spy Who Loved Me on. Oh, cool. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Well, in that case then, particularly having seen it from Spy Love Me Onwards, was this like really tonally jarring for you? Like going into this when it's, because it is so different to The Living Daylights. Can I tell you something? Um, and I remember this well, I remember having a lot of excitement for the movie Octopussy because mm. they had such an incredible uh, trailer and they had so much pomp and circumstance here in the United States around it. You were seeing things in stores all over the place. When it kind of came to a view to a kill on, um, mm. at least through the Dalton era, it was kind of a, Bond was a whisper here in the States. Mm. And we don't often talk about this, but I don't even remember seeing a commercial for, uh, uh, for License to Kill so much, in fact, that I later on when I became a huge Bond film, I was trying to find stuff. The commercials were terrible. The trailers were terrible for yeah. License to Kill. And I can almost see why people didn't want to see it. It looked like a bad Scarface movie. Like mm. it was all on the like, you know, hey, you know, gringo, you know, this and that. And, and yeah. they showed, I think, some of the bar fight, which again, I think, you know, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was the same year that Roadhouse came out, which was so hugely popular here in the United States with Patrick Swayze. But literally you could take the Roadhouse bar fights and the uh, License to Kill bar fights and put them together. They were like one and the same. There was nothing unique about it. That's so interesting because this is really one like when you read like critic reviews and fan reviews even from the time it was released, it felt like people were really, yeah, no one really liked it all that much. And it does just feel like that kind of seeped into the marketing as well. Like maybe they didn't know how to market it because it was such a difference. And yeah. I think it always stuck out to me as a bit of a ugly stepchild when I was becoming a Bond fan as well, because even, even though it had been out on video and stuff by the time I was watching them, it still just felt like something so different. Um, well, I'm gonna, can I, I'm gonna channel you for a moment. Mm. Do you, because I think some of the things that you've even brought to me is, uh, some of the fun factor of a Bond film. Mm. Bond films, for me growing up, and for me even as a father, were things that you could take your family to. You know, you could take your family to and just enjoy it, sit back, eat some popcorn, it's date night, what do you think of that? And come out afterwards and have a burger at the diner. That was amazing, remember when he did that? This is not that film. Nope. 
This is that <laughs> film where people are getting chopped into pieces and exploding and being set on fire. And yeah, this is not that film. This is Scarface meets Bond. And mm. I think the reaction uh, from critics and even people today is like, ooh. And now some some of your audience could say, well, come on, you know, Daniel Craig is, is serious. I'm like, yeah, but I mean, there's still that fantasy fun factor, things that are well written that aren't, this is almost so real. And I think that's the thing that Dalton brings to this in the most positive way is um, he's a very real bond. I mean, he mm -hmm. has feelings of vengeance and he's going back against them. And I, I think that this is almost like the bond movie that hit too close to home, especially right. if you lived in the United States. Yeah, because so much of it is like set there and it's, you know, it's, it's Mexico as well. And it's this, yeah, it's, um, I don't even think, I think is this the only film that Bond doesn't even go into like London at all? I think it might be. I think I, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll take that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I'm glad that you've moved on to Dalton actually, because he's a big reason why I really turned on this film so much, in, in a good way, I should say, because where we talked about the last time in The Living Daylights, I couldn't quite get a grip on his bond. I feel like maybe the script was just written as a bit too generic and it wasn't really tailored to him. I feel like this, they're really tailoring to him. They give him those dark, fierce, dangerous moments. And I think he really excels in them. I don't think he can do the one-liners very well still. Like some of the things he has to say when he's like, uh, when the guy comes in with the forklift through him, he says, looks like he came to a dead end. And it's like, oh no, you just can't. He's the only Bond who can't really do them as well. Like I think all of the others can, but I think like when he's got the knife to um, Lupe's throat in the, um, in, in the wave crest and yeah. those darker moments when he realizes that his friend Sharky has been killed and he goes out and shoots the guy with the harpoon gun. I love that so much. Um, I think he's really phenomenal in this. I think it's a really great Bond performance. How do you feel about him, particularly in relation to Living Daylights? I'm curious. Mm, a good, good question. Good follow up detail to that because <laughs> I, I was going to and ready and poised to say, I talk about highs and lows. And mm. I talk about the lows in the film being really low. Um, he is, of course, one of the highs. I mean, he is fantastic, especially this time around. I've enjoyed so much watching Timothy Dalton in both films. I really do. I think he's a phenomenal Bond, you know, cry sob sob that he didn't get a third film, although seeing him fight against a lady robot might have been a little weird now that we know what it was going to be about, a lady <laughs> Terminator, but I would have accepted it. He's amazing. He does take it very seriously. He's very Fleming-esque. He does that on purpose. He, what I loved about him is um, when they were celebrating and doing the whole wedding and things like that, he seems very jovial and, and happy. And he's a, he's a real human person. And then when that whole switch happens, you know, with his friends getting either maimed or killed, he does turn into this dark, dangerous person. And that's where I think he's actually, wait for it, I think he's better than Craig in the yeah. sense that this guy feels dangerous. I mean, uh, the part when Sharky gets killed and he's hanging upside down and Bond just goes right out and shoots the guy, you know, and just, you know, that's for Sharky. The danger, the knife to the throat, like you're saying, all of these things when he's taking Pam Bouvier and throwing her against the bed and he's like, this. I mean, there are so many scenes in this film where he seems dark and dangerous. To me, he feels like the perfect foil to the bad guy in this film because mm -hmm. the bad guy's also maniacally dark and dangerous. So I think his portrayal of Bond is wildly successful, wildly entertaining, and exactly what I want Bond to be. So honestly, if I rated his performance in this, I would give it a 10 out of 10, even slightly better than Living Daylights. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I will say this. One, one other thing I, I meant to tell you, and I don't know if you've seen it, but maybe you can find it. There is on the internet um, a behind the scenes shot of him shooting that guy with a spear gun where he continued on and he has this maniacal laugh. Have you seen that? I don't know if I have. You need to. I know you I like those deleted that. scenes, but he shoots him and he's almost like, you know. <laughs> oh, cool. Which makes him seem even like crazier and darker. Yeah. It's great hearing Timothy Dalton in some of the behind the scenes interviews and stuff, like hearing him talk about the character. And he just, yeah, he really hones in on the darker elements of Fleming and the character from that. And he really, like, you can tell that he just really cares. And I love some of his stuff that he talks about. Um, you know, he's 
I think it's really effective in this film. You can't really tell in some cases, like whether it's him or a stunt double and all that kind of stuff. And in one of the interviews that I saw in preparation for this, I really liked it where he was sort of saying how the audience shouldn't be like, thinking oh my goodness is timothy dalton there doing his own stunts they shouldn't be thinking oh my god it's a stuntman doing all of timothy dalton's yeah. stunts for him it should just seamlessly blend together and you should just think that the character is doing it and i think that that is really well structured in this one in particular that's a really great point because i do think he was the beginning and brosnan continues and so does craig mm. of getting out of the whole almost embarrassing Roger Moore, clearly stuntman, clearly Roger Moore differentials there. Because I think with this one, uh, the action is very good. Like even, you know, the scene when he's, you know, underwater and he, you know, does the whole water skiing, you know, they kept the mask on and everything like that, but you can't say, oh, that's definitely not him. It's, mm. it's well blended. Mm, no, totally. I love that water ski stunt, by the way. It's one of my favorite stunts in Bond where he's just like, yeah, the guy's just like going along in the water with no water skis. It's incredible. Um, mine, mine too. I've got the uh, fins and the uh, the vest and everything over here, and yes. yeah, it's a it's a big part of like why I've gravitated to so much of that. It's amazing. Ah, uh, nice. Okay, well, we've touched on him um, a little bit, but um, I think it'd be appropriate to talk about the villain next, Sanchez, because I know that this is another element of the film that you really like um, that you alluded to in in your um, ranking video. Um, yeah, Robert Darvey, how do you feel about him? I mean, yeah, so here's what you're doing. You know, if somebody tunes out of this video 10 to 15 minutes in, they're gonna be like, oh, David David loves it, which is not a bad <laughs> technique. Well done, sir. Um, but trust me, this will be the last point that I say this, but he's <laughs> phenomenal. Robert mm. Davi delivers a role. And I, I won't even say that the bad guy in here, a, a, a drug kingpin warlord to me, is kind of like, uh, you know, it's okay. Mm. It's almost like, you know, hey, why don't we just have a, a nasty politician next? You know, like, right. like how real are we going to get in the world of Bond? And interestingly, this time around, I found that what was missing from him was, you know, I like almost like a defect in my Bond villains. And what I mean mm. by that is like, you know, I'll use the technical term, like a screw loose. Mm. You know, I like them to be like, you know, just a little bit like, you know, I've got this pension to like explode the world. Mm. I kind of like that. And I think like even Safin may bring that back in, but him, he's just trying to run a business. <laughs> you know, he's just a bad guy that did something bad to Bond's friend, you know? Um, I think the lines he delivers are slow. And, mm. and, and I don't mean that in a negative way. He takes his time. He like, he lets this like, his lines like seep out. He's like, you know, listen to me, my friend. Loyalty is much more important. Whereas everybody, there are some lines in here delivered by people that are just like Stacy Sutton-ish, you know, <laughs> and he takes his time and he has these long lingering looks at Bond that look dangerous. Mm. When he finds out about Bond, I get nervous for Bond. Um, his, his revenge mode makes Bond's looks, you know, kind of Madeline-ish. I mean, just very mm. subtle. So I I have no fault. I mean, out of a Bond villain, if I'm rating him, he's like an eight or a nine out of 10. He's amazing. Right, yeah. No, I mean, I can only echo all of those positive um, comments. He's really, um, it, it's the, you know, one of the first times, maybe since, I'm just looking at the posters now, maybe since like even Red Grant, where you feel like it's a real physical, genuine, dangerous threat that Bond has to go up against. Um, and I think maybe that's why I didn't, I, like like we said, like I don't think this is a, a Bond film to show to your kids necessarily, but certainly I like my big campy, you know, Drax, uh, Goldfinger. I like my big campy Bond villains and he's definitely not that. He feels like a genuinely menacing character. And that's really great. I think that this is Robert Davi's like best role, certainly that I've ever seen. I've seen him in quite a few things and I think he is like just pitch perfect here. And I love how much like, so, so many Bond villains will just like dispose of their henchmen without a, a care in the world, that kind of thing. I love that they give him this character trait where he keeps talking about loyalty and how much that means mm. to him. And he really does stick to his word until like the very end where he goes like crazy and um, shoots the, the money obsessed guy. Um, he, he really does like loyalty does mean the world to him. And he's a man of his word. He hold you know, and so long as you're not double crossing him, he will keep to his word. And I really like that. He does like have this strange, like moral code that is quite different to mm -hmm. a lot of other Bond villains. And I just think that 
moral code works really well with Bond's whole scheme of turning him against his own, you know, henchmen and allies and all that kind of stuff. I think that all works really nicely. And he's really good at the one-liners, like when he says launder the money or, or whatever it is oh. that he says. It's, he, it's really he great. He pulls it off, whereas yeah. Timothy Dalton doesn't quite. And even his, you know, sort of one-liners that he has in uh, some of the more violent aspects, like I love mm -hmm. it, you know, when he leaves ah! this note, kind of the bloodstained note on there. Uh, this is just, this is him. This yeah. is that bad guy where he's trying to send a message, but he's also trying to be kind of pithy at the same time, which is, yeah, they did a nice job. And and by the way, I love some of the, th there are plot moments in here that I do actually like. The mm -hmm. whole idea of Bond giving him just enough information about him being a part of, of a government agent. And then when his lackey comes in and goes, hey boss, you're never gonna imagine who this guy is. And he goes, he's uh, from MI6 and he goes how did you know and he's like because I know things you know because I know things yeah. like, those moments were so beautifully intertwined to the plot and Robert Davi's portrayal of this character yeah totally and I think the chemistry with Dalton is really great as well in the sense that um and again, this is something that Dalton talked about in the behind the scenes where he talked about how Bond is a dangerous killer of a man. He's fierce and, and all of these things. He just so happens to be working for the side that we consider to be the good guys. Yeah. And you do get that sense in some of, like if, you know, um, uh, Robert Darby hadn't maimed Felix and maybe if Bond didn't work for MI6, if he wasn't, you know, dedicated to Queen and Country, maybe they would go into business together. Like I don't, yeah. they do have this really good chemistry together. Um, and, you know, I think it's a really good Bond and villain um, pairing these two together. Agreed. Um, just while we're on the main villain as well, because I I, I want to talk about some of the henchmen, mm -hmm. um, because this film has a lot. So I have a list yeah. here. We have Milton Crest, Ed Killifer, Dario, Truman Lodge, Joe Butcher, Colonel Heller. That's like six, like, named <laughs> sort of henchmen. And that's not you know, even counting the goons that Sanchez has sort of like running around throughout the film as well. Um, real highs and lows in there for me because I love Dario and Milton mm. Crest. I think they're terrific henchmen. But then in in like Sanchez's whole scheme, there's this like something to do with Stinger missiles and this Colonel Heller character that comes in. And that's where the plot really like goes off a cliff for me when he suddenly has these Stinger missiles. And I think to your point, like he is mainly just a, a legit, you know, not a legitimate businessman. He is a businessman with his drugs and that's his scheme. But similar to Scaramanga and the Man with the Golden Gun, they feel like they have to give him some kind of bigger scheme. And I yeah. think that for Sanchez is the Stinger missiles, but I completely lose what the point of that whole thing is. Um, the whole film is filled with that though. I mean, uh, it's, it's not just even around the henchmen. They have these, these tiny little plot moments that don't connect to the whole thing. And this was the issue that I think both of you, or both of you, both of us had in the living daylights. But in this film, for example, you have Bond, you know, in the lighthouse, go rogue. And then nearly one or two scenes later, you know, he's supposed to be out on this, you know, big rogue mission and things like that. And the MI6 guy that finds him just gets killed when the whole thing is hit by a, a bazooka tank. And then that's it. That's it. They don't even re-explore that, but they do that with so many different henchmen where you're trying to surround these really strong archetypes, you know, Bond and this main bad guy. But quite frankly, it's, it, why? You know, the accountant <laughs> guy is absolutely useless. Milton Crest is, he's okay. But the problem I have, and I know you do like Milton Crest, the problem I have with him is he just seems to be a foil, almost like a result, mm. a bad effect of, these things that either Bond is doing or uh, obviously the bad guy is doing, you know, killing them off, et cetera. It just, I didn't buy it. I didn't find like there was any danger that was brought to Bond or, or forwarding of the plot. So I thought the henchmen were just really weak in this film. I think it's I think it's quite episodic in that way like what you were saying it's kind of that you do kind of have your initial 20 minute episode in Florida and then it's 20 minutes after he's run away from MI6 and he's he's going somewhere else and then you have the bar and all these kinds of things um I I still quite like it like I like these uh, well I like most of these strange characters who kind of pop up and like Milton Crest doesn't really have all that much to do I guess that they have all these characters in there because they need characters there for Bond to be like turning Sanchez against whereas if he was mm. you know if he just had the one henchman like most Bond villains do that would be one and then out yeah. um whereas here I guess they needed to have this ensemble um 
Uh, how do you feel about Dario? How do you feel about uh, Benicio del Toro? Yeah, I, and by the way, fair point on 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 your other discussion of like there were at least three that he wound up turning. You know, hmm. uh, you know, as far as it, you needed some of that weaving, so he would do that. Uh, Dario, I I liked. Mm. Um, everybody seems to love him and I love the actor, of course, mm. but you know, I really watched it this time thinking like, oh, I like this guy. I know, you know, I'm going to really like his portrayal. I was kind of like, well, what's he doing? Like he's, <laughs> he's, he's sitting there, he's grinning, he's leering, you know, he's got these kind of dangerous, you know, um, you know, knife time moments. So you've got his knife right here. Oh, um, I can't. I can't quite embrace, first of all, the Foley artist. When he brings out this knife and you hear, oh. whoosh, 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 whoosh. I mean, the Foley artistry, in quotes, that is in this film is really awful. And mm -hmm. so, yes, you know, do you feel that kind of multiple danger with Dario? I do. I think he's the best out of the henchmen, mm. but I still think he falls a little bit flatter than what I'm used to. Oh, interesting. I, yeah. I, I he, He's the kind of character for me that if they'd have cast a lesser actor in the part, I think he would have just faded into the background. But because you have Benicio Del Toro, who's one of those actors who's just, he's, there's always something going on and he's reacting to something. I think his chemistry with Robert Darvey is great. And yeah. you do get the sense that he is this surrogate son and the, you know, it's never really talked about, but Sanchez probably thinks that he could be the, you know, the kingpin someday and take over from him. And I love that aspect to their relationship um e even like truman lodge like the money obsessed guy there's just little bits where they're showing the um the uh, the chinese um blokes around the bank at one point yeah. um and there's just these nice little details of where truman lodge is kind of thinks he's leading the group yeah, but then it's the steps. Yeah, yeah it's so love it's such a nice little touch where he's always ahead of sanchez you know, as if like he's leading it, but he's really not. They're really just following Sanchez. And I think that's really nice. So I think all the villains have these nice little bits, um, but maybe just too many of them. Yeah. And and I think what's hurting, and I'll go back to like the first five minutes that we've been talking about this. Mm. What's hurting for me is that the the lesser, lesser bad guys. So don't forget, you got your henchmen, you've got your, your lesser bad guys, and then you have your mm. lesser, lesser ones, which are like the lackey guys, the ones that are like, you know, in the truck that goes off, you know, the, the cliff and things like that, that are covered yeah. and stuff. They just absolutely were taken. I mean, it's almost like they went to the Miami Vice set and said, um, I'll take you, you, and you. I mean, they are just, <laughs> they're nothing. And, and because of that, you get these kind of like, meh that's kind of surrounding these people that just continue to give it this feeling like it's not a bond film like this is like a an action film starring bruce willis and you know maybe mel gibson but it doesn't feel bondish to me okay well let's see how you fare with the bond girls then uh because I, I, yeah i'm very curious to know how these um characters uh rank for you obviously you've got carrie lowell and talisa soto um i like that they're doing something a little bit different with bond and the female co-stars in this one and giving it kind of like a love triangle and they did something quite different with dalton in the previous one as well with cara where it was kind of like a one woman bond for most of that and here they're doing something a bit different with this love triangle which i really like i react to this one much better and i think a big part of that is that i really love Carrie Lowell as um, Pam Bouvier. She's one of my favorite Bond girls, actually. I think she's got an awful lot of spunk. Um, I think she's funny. I think she elevates some of the um, the scenes with a bit of lightness to, in a nice contrast to Dalton. Yeah. Um, and not in like an overly comedic, like Mary Goodnight kind of way. I just think she's got something kind of quite warm and affable about her. Um, how do you feel though? <laughs> so I think we share a lot of those feelings. Oh, right, uh, okay. With, yeah, with Pam Bouvier, um, but not all of them. And oh. I will explain. <laughs> so I love that they made this Bond girl um, spunky, uh, <laughs> tough. You know, I, I think the, 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 the best part of the bar scene to me is her, you know, <laughs> with the shotgun and everything like that. Like, you know, when she's got the shot, I love all those things, even how they dressed her. You, you could tell that she's kind of rough and tumble and mm -hmm. um, she's beautiful. I mean, I actually, you know, I don't like women with short hair. Not that I need to volunteer that, but um, <laughs> she looked amazing with short hair. She mm -hmm. looked fantastic. I love the part where she rips her dress and she's got another gun there. Um, no, I, there are moments that I like it. What I 
it fell a little flat with me is I really believe, oh, I'm going to get killed for this. I believe her performance is a bit uneven. I think hmm. she delivers some lines extremely well, extremely well. Hmm. And then I think she delivers some lines like when they're on the speedboat going away from the bar and she's like, listen here, mister, I am this and this and this. And then, you know, and, and it was just, it was kind of bad. And even the whole, you know, shaken, not stirred. It's oh, like, I it, love that. Oh, that's one of my favorite so, moments. I love the line. It comes across flat. And then the ending with the whole like wine, 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 you know, he hmm. likes her and not me. And like, that was weird. I think also some of the writing and I know that this was, you know, a combined, you know, writing jaunt, if you will. Um, some of the writing was not great for her character. Like, I didn't understand, like, after the bar scene, literally, they go down into the hull and have sex because he's James Bond. Like, like what was leading up to that? They, they, they just kind of met each other. And it's like, what is going on here? So I, not my favorite, not my favorite Bond girl. That is a bit of an odd moment, what you just mentioned. That is like, that is one of those things that feels like that's here because this is a Bond film rather than the characters would actually yeah. do that. Like even Dalton, like I don't, like Roger Moore would do it definitely, but not Timothy Dalton's Bond. Um, I love the, I love the whole thing where she's doing the shake and not stir. And then she takes a sip of the martini and she like, really hates it. And she like cringes. I love that. Um, but what about Talisa Soto then? Um, Cause she's, uh, she's a quite an interesting character i think lupe 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 exactly. yeah lupe, um cool name. yeah no really nice um and she's gorgeous like she's absolutely beautiful um, gorgeous and i absolutely. like that she's like you know the villains like mole like gangsters mole kind of thing and bond is sort of flirting with her and all that kind of stuff um i agree with you that the climax to this love triangle is not handled particularly well and it's a little bit soppy when he jumps into the pool and embraces pam and uh, yeah, Lupe seems perfectly fine going off with the politician guy. Um, but I, I don't like her as much as Pam, but I think she's she's good for what she's asked to do in this. Uh, cringeworthy. <laughs> I, I think she's cringeworthy. I think that she's Stacey Sutton-ish, which I, I'm sorry to keep using Stacey Sutton as that bar, <laughs> that low bar that fell onto the floor. But... Um, you know, lines like, you know, I've known James for five minutes, but I'm, I love him. I love James. James is great. He's so special. Um, I think she's wonderfully exotic. And at times she definitely plays, you know, the unfortunately, you know, battered person. And it's horrible, you know, some of the stuff that uh, is afflicted to her. I think her role is, is there's some great moments with her and Bond that are, are written well. Hmm. I I don't think she delivers the role uh, as good as she, I don't know, somebody else could have. I hate to be like that, but she's, I, I think her acting is extremely flat. I think it feels like they hired a beautiful person. And mm. I, I don't like that with the, if I, if I take a look at the best Bond women and best Bond girls in the franchise, they can do it all. They're badass. Mm. They're great acting they take their time and it's well-written. And so when I compare it against all four of those checkoff points and she comes across with maybe one-ish, um, I can't stack her up in a, in a good way. I think I give her a bit of a pass. Like I agree, like some of the line deliveries and the acting is a bit wooden in places and she's almost certainly cast because she's so stunningly attractive. Yeah. Um, I think she gets a bit of a pass because she is the secondary Bond girl of the thing and Pam is obviously the um, the main one and Pam has more scenes and is required to do a bit more I think. Sure. I think Talisa Soto is really good when it, particularly in that first scene where um, Sanchez comes in and takes her boyfriend away and she's crying as he whips her I think she's just, I, I think the voice is just a little bit flat and I don't know if that's like the looping that they had to do afterwards or what and if this were the 60s she'd probably have been dubbed by Nicky Vandersel who knows but uh <laughs> I, I, I think, look, yeah. Take a look at um, someone like uh, Bernice uh, Marlowe, you know, yeah. Severine's character. Mm. Secondary character has a small role and just owns it. Monica Bellucci, people like that. I mean, they they can really just own those moments and act the living shit out of them. Mm. But I just don't think she does that. And so, especially this time around, I was like, that is like oak or bamboo or whatever wood you want to choose, but that is wooden. 
I guess the writing is also like like you mentioned about the writing. There was a writer's strike on when they were making yes. this film, so I think it was Michael G. Wilson had to take on more of the writing responsibilities than Richard, than Richard Maybom. Maybom. Yeah, who was yeah. more the writer of the two of them. Um, yeah. So I, I I think that's perhaps partly to blame as well. Um, okay, well, shall we talk a bit about allies next? Oh, oh sure. Oh, I, I was going to say, was there one more Bond girl you wanted to talk about? Della or no? Oh, Della. Oh, we can talk about Della. She she didn't even make it into my notes. <laughs> so I will say, um, you know, poor, poor Della here. You know, we've got her, her little <gasps> lighter and stuff like that. Oh, that is cool. Which is quite nice and, and actually works too when I have fluid oh. in it, which I don't think I do right now, but it does. Um, huh. Yeah, I'll, I'll get it to work someday. But um, so I will say this about uh, this this last Bond girl that you know unfortunately met her end. She was on Three's Company, she which was a, a sitcom here in the states, and she played one of the characters. And she seemed like she was acting in a sitcom. Her hmm. acting was, I think, very sitcomish, very TV like. Um, her relationship with Bond is very strange, like. <laughs> Is she getting married to James Bond or is she getting married to Felix because she wants to get to James Bond, but she's not getting married to Felix because she loves him. That is for damn sure. <laughs> like she's like macking out on him. She's making out. She's like hugging him and caressing him much more than your soon to be husband. Like what is the actual relationship here? And when she's dead, I do like this. I love that they gave her like this, like Joker smirk when she's dead. Like, yeah. If you go back and look, it's like this weird, like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but I I don't I don't get the relationship at all. It's really strange. Like I'm not married, you're married. Is it really a tradition for the best man to kiss the bride on the wedding day? Because I've never heard of that in any other um area. It, it, it can be a tradition. It wasn't at mine. It's certainly not having full on sex with them. <laughs> and I just felt like these two were just in the closet. Like when they come through that door and they're like dancing with each other and she runs up to him. I'm like, what just transpired? Like, was there like a, a penthouse form letter whisper saying like, hey, James, it's, it's the last chance for me to be a single woman. Do you mind like 007 minutes in heaven? What? Like, can we just do something? <laughs> weird it, it it is weird but th this is this actually uh goes on nicely to the next um thing that i want to talk about which was felix um oh. felix himself because david hedison comes back from um live and let die um and I, I as much as i love david hedison and i really do like i think he's probably my favorite felix oh. and i like his performance here i do i just have a feeling that this would have been a bit stronger if Felix were a bit younger and more of a contemporary of Bonds. And I'm not saying we bring back the guy from the previous one that didn't make much of an impression either way, but I feel like there would have been an extra sort of like tinge of sadness to his maiming if he was sort of more like Bonds age. And you got the sense that he was, at, you know, someone who was at kind of like his physical peak. Whereas David Hedison as Felix, you kind of have a like, oh, well, you're a few, <laughs> a couple of weeks away from retirement. Uh, and that kind of age difference between Bond yeah. and Felix is a bit, I don't think it quite works in this capacity as much as I like the actor. That's a Yes, so I, I certainly can't di disagree with it. I think it would have been better. I know why they brought him back. I get that. And, um, you know, I'll say this. The age thing was off from, I think, I'm just going to say it, the wife all the way through <laughs> to a, a colleague of Bond's. Um, I, I will say this, and, you know, listen, we've got to be authentic on these. If it, It's not going to be the most popular thing I've ever said, trust me. But um, I think he's a bit wooden in this. And, and a lot of it, I, I do blame on the director, um, the way this looks as a film, but also the way the actors come across. Because I think with some actors, you can get across different things. But if I go back to Live and Let Die with the same actor, he does kind of have this um, way that he projects his lines. You know, it's like, you know, can Angus, let, um, you know, sewing a flag, you know, and knitting a flag. And you know, hey, James, you know, I'm, I'm doing much better now that my wife's dead, you know, just, oh, God. <laughs> he's got this kind of flatness to him. And then I just, I didn't feel anything when he was being eaten by a shark back then. And I, I kind of didn't feel it now. Like, I didn't feel the gravitas of, of it all, which I know I should have. Um, I, I kind of didn't quite buy it. 
And I, I think it's the the acting that I was seeing in this film. I was getting so much from Dalton and Davi, oh, D and D, um, <laughs> that everybody else had a, a really long mountain to climb to sell me on what was happening to them. So he does fall flat for me. And then to me, the weirdest part of this entire film, bar none, worse than her shagging Bond before she gets married, is at the end of the film when Bond calls him, ripped off leg, totally maimed, wife dead five minutes ago. And he's like, hey, James. And he's having his pillow fluff by an attractive left. Yeah, you know, I spoke to him and he, he's got a job for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you whole crazy man. I'll talk to you later, click. <laughs> What the actual F just went on? They have good morphine at that hospital. <laughs> it must be really good whatever he's on. <laughs> Let's blame it on the morphine or blame it on the fact that we just had this, I'll buy into, we had a very serious Bond film. Mm. And then in the last five minutes of the film, you're going to make it silly Bond. Mm. Like, make up your mind. Is it, I mean, that's a Roger Moore-esque ending, which everybody going like, you know, happy, go lucky, you know, fish winking, all this type of <laughs> stuff. But then... No, I mean, so yeah, Felix, he, and actually he's not my favorite Felix. Like I will actually put Jack Lord and um, and Daniel Craig's Felix, you know. Oh, Je right, uh, yeah, Jeffrey Wright, yeah. Jeffrey Wright higher than yeah. this one, but um, yeah, so I, I, I'm gonna get a lot of flack for being so harsh, but. <laughs> well, I'm, well, I'm with you on the ending at least. Um, I'll, I'll kind of work back and talk about some of the earlier bits. Of course, but of course. Like that ending is really, I feel like that is a hangover from um, the reaction that they had to Majesty's Secret Service, which obviously has such a dark ending, like one of the most dark endings in movies. I mean, certainly yeah. in the Bond films and the reaction that that film had. And in, indeed, like if you're gonna have an audience like walk out of the cinema on something so tragic and poignant, that's gonna leave them a certain way. Whereas you look at something like Casino Royale, which handles the tragedy or even Skyfall, which handles like a really tragic moment. And then they give you an extra scene that's like a kick-ass kind of like, yeah, you can leave the, you know, the, uh, the cinema sort of um, with your fist in the air kind of thing. Um, and I feel like they just didn't wanna go anywhere near it. They didn't want to deal with any kind of relationship drama, which, I think it's kind of bad writing because you know that Della is just there as this like thing for Bond to avenge and Felix yeah. being maimed is just a thing for Bond to avenge. And I think it's a shame that he doesn't come back actually like with maybe a wooden leg like he does in the books or, or yeah. anything like that. I think that would have been really interesting to see that progress. This is the last kind of Felix appearance in this continuity. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm totally with you. The ending is so weird to seeing him all like happy and like eyeing his like, you know, attractive young nurse. It's just like, nah, I really don't buy this but earlier on I think he's really great like I actually really love him in the whole shark scene where he gets mm. like he gets his leg bitten off I really feel for him it's probably the most like cringy and, and I mean that in a good sense yeah seen in all of Bond for me like just seeing him like slowly going down because they've got this meat on the other hook and the shark's biting that and that's yeah. affecting the weight I think it's so sick and it really sells me it on yeah, it true. really sells me on the villain's evilness just yeah. that whole scenario and the fact that he's just gonna like oh yeah no we're just gonna have him bite your leg off and then we're gonna take you out you're not actually gonna die we're gonna really put you through this emotional trauma so I love all of that and I think he does a really good job like when he's like where's my wife and then he lunges at them yeah. like that's the one scene that he has to really properly act and I think he does a good job because I'm less impressed with some of the wedding hijinks beforehand <laughs> that's you know what I, I will absolutely acquiesce to that he does even i'm thinking about it when he says like uh, i'll see you in hell and he's mm. you know kind of like this um yeah he does do a, a good job with that so to my point the guy can act mm. i just don't think the director kept it consistent same with mm. pam bouvier they i'm just looking for consistency of these people right. who i know can act and do a good job yeah well, what about um, what about Q then? While we're talking about Bond's allies, because this is his Aww. most expanded role in the whole series, and I love him in it. <laughs> and some people don't. Some people say they don't like Q in the field. And no, actually, before I get, do you mind? Um, I actually promised Danielle I was going to do this. Um, do you mind if I just take a quick picture of you, real quick? Um, I was going to take a screen <laughs> grab, but let me just get this real quick because I'd love to get a shot of this and oh, God. for prosperity. Here we go. Okay. Smart. Say smart. Okay. Oh, here it comes. <laughs> Stupid Polaroids. Here we go. Doesn't oh, look brilliant. like you and me, but 
Oh wow! It even like yeah, it even put a skeleton in um, Sheriff Pepper here in the background. It, it did. It did. <laughs> By the way, this actually um, shoots a laser, that like a laser pointer out of here. So I mean, it's <laughs> my point being, I love all of the Q scenes. Um, oh yeah, he is absolutely fantastic. He's you know, I'm really sitting you know working on stuff, and he's amazing. And this is one of my favorite Q scenes in the entire franchise yeah. because they do give Q something to do. He is, you know, he's fatherly, but uncle-ish, you know, like they even say that in the movie. Um, I love the lines between him and Timothy Dalton. I think that mm -hmm. he adds some much needed like humor mm -hmm. into all of this. But I think also, you know, at first when he's taking all those things out, you're like, ugh, they're just doing props for props sake and but no he uses the dentonite he uses all the things that he's he's going to do i love the broom scene when um, he's like yeah. sweeping up and he talks in there because those are those fun factors i was just coming from with like roger moore mm. so i think q is great in this i think i think his acting and his consistency in this film is amongst the best Oh, I completely agree. I think this is Desmond Llewellyn's best like acting role yes, and what they yes. give him to do. And and even like I think the actor looks like pretty good. I don't know if he like lost weight or something. Like I mm. think like he looks sort of slightly different to how he does in some of the others. And I don't know if that was intentional or not. Maybe he had like dysentery on the Mexican location shoot. I don't know. <laughs> but uh he certainly looks a bit slimmer in this one. But um I completely agree. And I think yeah. the levity that he brings at just the right moments, I actually love that construction because it it is a really dark film and i think for the most part with him and with pam i think that the the moments of humor and levity that they add throughout is just like just right until the very end with felix and that whole last scene at the uh at, at the party but um yeah i think he's great for for adding in those moments i yeah. we're in a hundred percent agreement even at the end when he consoles her you know, and says, yeah. well, that's just, you know, that's just Bond, you know, don't, don't worry about it. He has some great moments. He's, to me, better than Felix Leiter, better than any of the other allies, for sure. Oh, definitely. Yeah. No, and I, I just love that we got him along for this adventure. Like, they certainly seem to be, like, ramping up, like, with Octopussy and the Living Daylights as well. He got more and more to do, and here he finally, it kind of peaks here where he's along for so much of the adventure, and it's really, yeah, it's really cool. Um. So going back to your analogy of like this film being like a really great, uh, uh, no, sorry, a really meh meal with a really great dessert. When does the greatness kind of start for you for the climax? I I is that like when all the explosions start happening and everything like the big tanker chase? Even before that, I mean, I okay. really enjoyed this time around when they go to um, the temple. And, mm. and, and I even love the fact that, you know, you had that big kind of quasi, you know, volcano type moment, like in the old Bond films when the thing opens up and it was totally nonsensical to have a helicopter go in there. You don't need to do that, but <laughs> it was kind of fun and Bondish, just like in the volcano. Um, and then from there till I would say um, uh, like the very end of the movie, I, I like it. I think um, that's the dessert. Mm. Obviously the tanker scene, I really enjoy, I really like there are problems with it, of course. You know, the fact that the the truck does a wheelie for, for no explicable reason other than to do a wheelie, like how could it even possible? Why is it doing that? Does it go through the fire better? Doesn't it expose itself more to the gas tank that way? I mean, so many questions come into mind. Um, and, and by the way, I don't know if you knew this, but I found this later on. So what was kind of maniacal is uh, the, the Bond production crew along that, roadway had a lot of different issues because it was considered haunted. I don't know if you heard about this, but yes. a, a van of nuns had gone off the cliff for real, just like in the movie. Yeah, And um, because of that, they thought it was hunted by nuns. And there was a picture that the photographer took of the explosion where there's like a, a fiery hand coming down. Yeah, I know. It's, it's like really weirdly supernatural. That photo is incredible. Like, it, yeah, it just looks like a fiery hand coming out of it. Um, I, I mean, I, I, it's one of my favorite Bond climaxes. It's just, I think it's some of the best like film explosions I've ever seen. Like, it, I, I know that that one inspector, which is apparently like the biggest ever made for a film or whatever, it pales in comparison to some of these with the tanker chase. And I don't know like if that was just because the weather was so hot, so they look so fiery. And like I'm sure there's yeah. like a, a hole in the ozone layer, like just above that shot, that that location where they did this. But um 
it's terrific i for me like it's a faultless climax from as soon mm. as like bond throws the thing in the lab which causes the fire and then everyone runs out i think it's just so perfectly done up and right up until he sets sanchez on fire I, i'll tell you what it is for me and i, I can't argue the faultless remark it feels like a bond film suddenly you know you've mm. got bond who is you know, you've got this discovery with him and Dario, you know, this, like, you're nervous. You're like, oh my gosh, he recognizes him. What's going to happen to, to the scene when everything's exploding and, and Bond is on, you know, the conveyor belt. And my gosh, he's hanging by this. And then Dario gets his, you know, incredibly violent, you know, uh, comeuppance all the way through to, like you said, you know, the, the, the tanker chase. And my gosh, who doesn't love a giant stinger missile? Good you know, Lord. Type moment you know to be kind of sectioning out there <laughs> where just everything seems like bombastic and bigger and i i felt like here's my bond film yeah like they promised me a bond film and now here it is so mm. i would agree with you and that ending i mean bond using this gadget which you just think is a, is a throwaway but it's so connected to felix to be the thing that gets the bad guy and also a second like punch in the throat to the bad guy is that he's covered in his genius material of gas. Like he decided <laughs> to put the cocaine in the gas. Well, guess what? You're screwed, buddy, because of that. I love it. Yeah, that's a really lovely bit of writing. Like, yeah, that whole villain demise, it's one of the best ones. And I do agree with you, like from an action standpoint, I do like the, what action we have in the film an awful lot. Like the pre credits stuff with the plane is really cool or the underwater stuff. I actually really like the underwater stuff in this film, if you can believe Who that. Who are I you? Know. Who are you? <laughs> even, even though like, Bond under the manta ray thing is a bit silly, but I, I like it. Um, the only action that I can't really defend, even though I love the buildup, I love when he puts the dentonite toothpaste along the window to blow it up, to get the sniper to shoot Sanchez. It's great. But then we have this little action flourish with ninjas of all things. And uh, I was wondering when you were going to bring this up. Yeah. <laughs> Calvin. Calvin. Yeah. This is awful. And I mean, all right. So everybody's watching this should know that I, I texted you yes. during this. <laughs> um, and, and all I could hear the ninjas literally, they're going. <laughs> It was awful. And why? Why? Why are they there? I don't know. <laughs> it's it's a really strange tangent. I was thinking about what does this do from like a story perspective? Because I, I kind of like that we have the Emma sent another British agent there to bring Bond back, basically. But then there is this whole thing with these other agents and they're there because they've got some kind of uh, thing going on where they're like got some kind of thing going on with Sanchez and then we're suddenly thrown into the middle of that it feels like something a bit too much but then in this sequence like Sanchez's men come it explodes we have this strange little action sequence where one of the ninjas apparently was in love with one of the other ones and she's really upset and then one of the other guys is like don't let them take you alive and then she go has a little action sequence this completely nameless character who we have no idea who she is um it feels really weird I guess it is to get to a point where Sanchez thinks that Bond is you know, running from the same people that he is, or that Bond, you know, managed to foil the assassination, the assassination attempt on him. But I don't know why you need ninjas in here. I don't know why it couldn't just be some fellow MI6 agents coming to get Bond back. I, I can only tell you this, because I remember this very well. Everybody was into ninjas in that part of the 80s. Everybody. Huh. There were all these like very low grade canon films were making all these ninja films. Enter the Ninja, Revenge of the Ninja, um, American Ninja. I, I, and actually, I saw them all because I was really into martial arts. And I almost feel like they were going through, like, line by line, like, where's our lethal weapon moment? Let's have the DEA guys running in slow motion. Let's do this. And I'm telling you, they said, we need to have four and a half minutes of Ninja. Where huh. are we going to put it? Oh, what about that MI6 scene where they were all capturing him? Oh, it's not going to make sense. But all right, four and a half minutes of Ninja. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Those noises are really strange. <laughs> I don't know what they're saying. It feels like they should be going with like some like throwing stars or something, but there's none of that. It's just, yeah. And and really her odd. death, you're right. Her little thing. First of all, I mean, the graphic is anything like they shoot her in like each of the breasts, like 
was really weird. Like the yeah. squib guy was like, I'm not feeling creative that day. I could do here and here, but I'm just going to, do you mind if I just put, well, I'm just going to put one on each nipple. There you go. <laughs> I mean, watch that scene. It's graphic. It is really odd. It's one of those moments as well. Like, I, I don't know if in America is the film rated PG-13 or is it R? It, I think it's PG-13. Right. Yeah. Okay. Because here it's a 15, which is like the highest rating that a Bond gets. Like mm. most of them are either like PG, some of the earlier ones are PG, and then they go up to like 12 when you get to Brosnan and beyond. But this is a 15. And I'm not surprised. Like, But that sequence in particular, like because you have her and she's so emotionally traumatized by yeah. her partner being killed or, or whatever he is, and then that violence, it just feels really like yeah really pointed and kind of mean-spirited it's a very odd moment it is um but i do love the music throughout the whole thing you mentioned earlier on that you're not a huge fan of it the michael Kamen score no i'm not i do like i do like the fact that he places the bond theme quite a bit mm. you know he and he uses it in the right ways there's there's one bit of musical cue where um i really do like all the things even the little um colombian music kind of played you know bond theme i do like that yeah. but from that even the uh the the sound score the, the oh, sorry not the score the um the theme song from the movie mm. i think is just okay mm. like it's nothing that i'm gonna toe tap to or play in my car i just it's it's all it's all just very passable Mm. Well, I, I, I'm kind of with you on the song. It's not one of my favorites. I think it's fine. Um, I think mm. Cue the Music actually do a pretty phenomenal version of it. Like when I saw them they live, do. it was incredible. Um, the score itself, I actually really love. And I'm actually really glad that as much as I love John Barry, I am quite glad that they went for someone different here because I think okay. it does give it a slightly more dangerous, like a bit more of a, a, a spikier edge, which I do quite like. And I love that he kind of weaves the Bond theme in throughout. It's... Um, really nicely done i mean if by spiker and edger you mean a uh, tv uh movie yes oh. that's exactly what <laughs> by the way i i'm loving this debate because with some debates for, for any of you that have seen some of our debates before with some of these we're kind of like you know just playing off each other like oh i see your point i say this one we're pretty far apart i it mean feels which that I, way. I kind of like yeah which yeah because like with the music like yeah that's an example of like i think it's really great in this i wish that michael Kamen had come back and done golden i i mean probably most people probably wish golden eye a different composer but, that was that was a gift that was an easy one yeah yeah <laughs> hard to argue that okay i have one more thing on my list um because we talk about this you know in all of these films lifestyle like the Bond's oh. clothes, like the, the, the lifestyle elements, like, because I do think, and I'm really curious to get your take on this. I think that this is probably the worst Bond has looked in any of the films, even when he's in like the tux and everything, there's something about his hair. I just, I don't think of him as being a particularly stylish bloke in this. And I, I feel like that may well be intentional on the filmmaker's parts. Um, but how, how do you feel about that? This is a, this is a bad lifestyle uh moment for Bond. right okay. yes I totally agree with you um several things first of all you're right we'll start with the hair um i guess they said at one point you know let's what do we go for his hair um should we go dracula 1700s <laughs> yes let's do that <laughs> and this whip back of his hair this slicking down this widow peak which looks so unbondish mm. and i love him you know his hair looks fine and like the other stuff and, mm. and look timothy dalton looks great as bond Mm. But outside of his scuba suit, his clothes are just hanging off of him like sacks. His tuxedo looks like he just pulled it off of the rack. It's two sizes too big. It's just sloping all over him. And yeah, I just, I can't get into it. Like I was even able to get it into it more with the living daylights, which I had mm. a little, you know, kind of foibles against. But this one, it's just probably one of his worst. Yeah. Okay. Now that's interesting because you're very much the expert on these things. So I, I'm always watching these th these things. Things like I wonder what David thinks about this actually. But uh, yeah, no, because I really liked like a lot of the clothes that he wears in Living Daylights. I like his look in the Living Daylights. Mm. He'd say it's just two years later. It's very um, yeah. I don't know. They're putting his hair into odd shapes that make his head look kind of oddly proportioned. It's very strange. Right. But even with like even the other characters in it like I don't know if I like much of what Sanchez is wearing like in the scenes where he's talking with Bond and he has this kind of pinstripe suits uh, uh 
shirt on. Yeah. Um, again, it's just very odd choices in that regard. Yeah, I think the best thing that in the entire film, clothing-wise, was a combination of Q's safari belted jacket and, and, and matching pants that he had with the uh, captain's cap. That was amazing. <laughs> yes. And um, also Bond's uh, blue Sea Island pajamas that he wears when he wakes up from Sanchez's things. Those yeah. were great. Outside of that, we need to get them all in a pile, throw on some of that gasoline from his truck, <laughs> take the lighter and burn the living daylights out of all of those clothes. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Okay, so as we draw this to a close, I do want to ask you, like, has this always been a low ranking one for you? Has it ever sort of you know, sort of clawed its way up the ranks or has this always been like re on rewatching it year on year or however long you've watched it, you know, um, is it always low ranking? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preface my, it's a great question. I'm going to preface my answer to say this. Um, with so many people in the Bond community being so passionate about different films, my rankings on many film and my appreciation of films that were ranked relatively low have mm -hmm. gone up. You did it. I, I always tell you, you've done it with Moonraker. Joe Darlington did it with Octopussy. Those things have just ranked so much higher believe it or not, um, in my estimation. And I go back to them now and I appreciate them more. License to Kill defies it. It's, it's, like, yeah. um, it's like a view to a kill. Um, yeah. these, these have not grown in appreciation. I actually was so excited to watch this again because I'm like, mm -hmm. wow, I could walk away and Calvin's going to make me feel like I can really appreciate this. And outside of Dalton and Davi's performance, this has not gotten better. And in many ways, I'm like, wow, this, this is... I, I'm going to need to put this on the shelf for a long time oh, wow. after this one. I need to, I need to take, I need to take a little waiver and a little break. You know, I got a case of the horribles uh, from, <laughs> from License to Kill. So it has not only stayed and maintained low ranking, it will continue for some time, Calvin. Oh, wow. That's really interesting. Huh? Because this is one for me, like, Time and time again, like over the last like 10 years, probably as much as I've sort of watched it, it just keeps like blip, 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 like going up slightly more and more that. each time. I always see something in it that I feel like I appreciate an awful lot more. Yeah. Um, can I can I ask you an unrelated, somewhat related question to that? Which sure. which Bond film, you don't have to rank a whole bunch of them, but which Bond film goes down over time for you? Or do they Ooh. all go up? But But is there one in particular you're like, like you said something, um, I, I watched this, like Spectre, was Spectre kind of good and then it's gone down or what oh, would definitely. you say? Yeah, no, uh, Spectre and Quantum of Solace, both, like from when I initially saw them at the cinema um, and Die Another Day very much, because I did quite like that when I saw it at the cinema, those three have all kind of trickled down because I think they just take a while to sort of fit in when it's the new one as well. And you get so yeah. excited about seeing it. Um, it takes a little bit of a, a while for it to fit in with all of the others. So you come mm -hmm. away from the cinema being kind of like, okay, well, that was all right. And then you start to sort of stew on it more <laughs> and rewatch yeah. it when it comes out and everything. So so it is, those ones have kind of gone down. Um, yeah, I'm just looking at the posters now because a lot of the others kind of like flit, you know, up and down. But sure. a, some of them like Dr. No from Rush With Love, Thunderball have often been quite low ranking ones for me as well. So um yeah but no this one like it's not quite in my top 10 yet but hmm. it might well get there someday it's i feel like it's just edging i think i saw a video where you ranked it lucky number 13. oh right that out sounds of like 20, yeah. out of 26 it was like right in the middle yeah that sounds about right actually i think maybe yeah maybe a little bit higher now i don't know but, 12? Uh, but quite possibly yeah <laughs> Yeah. Um, okay. Well, thank you very much, David. Unless, is there anything else that you want to bring up? Or no, I think I think I I covered everything completely. I mean, like I said, this is one going into it, and now that we've you know tasted this debate, I can honestly say I'm I'm definitely black and white on it. You know, and, mm. and obviously, you know, um, I feel more extreme against this. So this is, uh, this is, this was one of, the, I don't want to say it's easy. None of these are easy because we love all the Bond films, folks, no more hate mail. No, yeah. um, <laughs> but, but this is one that I, I just find problematic still. Huh. Interesting. Oh, wow. I think, I think this might be the first 
debate we've had where we're coming one of us is coming away like you know what i, I like it less now after we've talked about it <laughs> see what you did i was okay before man i know i was like oh this is my great license to kill redemption story <laughs> for um, the next one I, I promise you the next one you will you will make me hear the angels sing <laughs> Great. Okay, well, do let us know what you think about License to Kill in the comment section below, because I know that this one has been on quite a journey. I feel like it's quite popular, as the Dalton films generally are in the fandom these days. So, um, yeah, do let us know in the comment section below how you feel. Um, and, yeah, I think with all that being said, we can sign off for, uh, for this one. Until next time. We need to decide what we're going to do next, actually. Oh, we will, I'm sure. <laughs> See ya. Take care.